I'm Mr. Fullman, and I'm Paul Wilms, and we're going fishing. To start this adventure, Paul and I must fly from California to Fort Worth, Texas, and then on to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Having met with other group members, the mission begins. Departing the domestic terminal of Cancun for yet another flight. Ready for a big week of fishing? Yeah. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Our modest size plane awaits and requires careful weight distribution. First class. <laughs> I'm, kind, I'm kind of wishing that I'd had more for breakfast this morning. You can. While the pilot finishes googling what some of the buttons do, we all buckle in. Once up in the air we have a good view over the spectacular coastline for a one hour flight south-southwest to Espirito Santo Bay. Having landed safely in a remote airport amongst the mangroves, the Federales thoroughly inspect our luggage for contraband. Satisfied we're all nice people, our bags are loaded into the waiting wagons. The lodge's co-manager Kiara takes the wheel for a two hour drive back north along a rough coastal track heavily overgrown by jungle. One knows for certain one is in paradise when there are palm trees. Even if the wind howls with gale force and powerful storm cells march across the horizon. It's time to settle into our far from rustic accommodation and have a cup of tea. By the following morning, the wind seems to have increased its ferocity. We fishermen are preparing for a big day on the water. So this is our more than acceptable habitacion here on the um, El Espirito del Baya Los Santos. Mm -hmm. The water has a real bad odor. <laughs> Smells like sulfur, doesn't it? Even worse. Dane is the other half of management and takes the wheel of the chariot that'll transport the lot of us to the boat launch. A 20 minute drive along the same track that runs along the thin strip of land between the ocean and the swamps. I have friends that are going to come here later in the year. Uh, I post it, you know. At a point along the road we reach a junction. The road northeast ends at a lighthouse on the peninsula, while the road northwest leads to the bay. Nearing journey's end, we pass through an unoccupied fishing village, though this is about to change. Lobster season will open in the coming days, transforming the population from none to some. Upon arrival at the boat launch, we nimbly disembark our carriage and gather our effects. At the water's edge, we inspect the boats and meet our guides. We're introduced to Jesus, Jorge, Luis, and Alex. <laughs> Although our fishing buddy remains the same, we are scheduled to rotate boats and guides. Adios. Allowing us to capitalize on their different styles and knowledge of the bay. After all the traveling, we're here, oh. we finally made it. After that ride on that road yesterday, that was, like, that was almost, uh, what's the word I use? Shit ass? Unbearable. Oh. <laughs> Man.
leaving the launch point, Jesus opens up the throttle and aims the boat out into the vastness of the bay. Espirito Santo Bay has an abundance of shallow salt flats fringed by mangroves. It's out in these vast watery plains we have four main target species. Snook, bonefish, permit and tarpon. On our arrival, Jesus slows down the motor to make a more stealthy approach. We're not the only ones out here. The occasional dolphin or two approach the boat in the unlikely event we might know something they don't. A manatee, the size of a minivan, prefers slightly deeper water. And amongst the mangroves are more sinister residents. The sandy shallows are home to our first target species. Bonefish travel alone, in pairs, and even large shoals, along with an incoming tide to feed on worms, crustaceans, and mollusks. Despite being a common aquatic resident, they are notoriously difficult to spot, and are known by some as the ghost of the flats. After some time patrolling seemingly lifeless water, Jesus spots a small school of bonefish and Paul springs into action. The first cast is a mess, with the screaming winds whipping the fly line back around his feet. Quickly recomposing for the next cast, the fish have now moved offside the boat and the wind, with more agreeable casting opportunities. The little minnow fly is stripped above the weeds in the hope it may be mistaken for a shrimp bringing it within range of some not too picky eaters, and we get our first strike. You'll know about it when a bonefish takes the fly with even small specimens capable of long runs and a dogged battle. Not highly regarded as an eating fish and aptly named, this bonefish goes back into the water to fight another day. So here we are in the first river and we want to start fishing for bonefish and then we want to check that bush for little snook. After that we can chase some permit but on the north side. I'm going to change that fly over. I'm going to, I'm going to put a weed guard on it though. Common snook are ambush predators with a liking for good cover such as the maze of mangrove roots. This makes fishing for snook during high tide difficult as they are able to retreat deep into the impenetrable tangle of vegetation. It's as the tide recedes, they are forced out onto the fringes where a keen eye can detect them. 
accuracy is crucial. Shooting the fly deep into overgrown gullies, under drooping branches, and as near to the roots as possible while avoiding snags. Sloppy, splashy casts, too close to the fish, scare them off with a swirl of mud. Mm. A nice, well-placed cast can have quite a different effect. Once hooked, the instinct of the fish is to run straight for safety, so Jorge propels the boat backward, keeping the fish clear of cover. After a stout battle, Paul lands the fish, and a quick picture big one. before releasing it back to the water. My first cast is a debacle, ending up tangled in the mangroves, and Jorge has to give it a few good whacks with a stick to free it up. Next cast, however, is spot on. Oh, nice. oh yeah, we landed that. <laughs> Eight pounds. Oh, good. Well, that's my first snook on a fly line anyway, so I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> it's, old, it's old school for, for Paul. Uh, you're used to it, eh? Oh, no, it's no big deal. <laughs> uh, heck, I guess uh, you got to get over it, but you're going to get over it pretty soon. No, you really don't. You know, this was a thrill. This is a thrill, definitely. Well, we just landed here at Rio number two, two. in Espirito Santos Bay. Yeah. Here's Alex, our guide for the day. And uh, so far, after getting out and landing uh, for a quick baño stop, of course, Gavin catches two snook right off the bat. So it looks like it's a good omen for the rest of the day. We're looking forward to it. Found in a variety of habitats from coastal waters, estuaries, and rivers is the highly sought after tarpon. They are spirited fighters known for spectacular leaps and are capable of growing up to eight feet long and weighing over 200 pounds. Under the leadership of Alex, the day begins by searching for snook, shooting the fly as close to the vegetation as we dare. Then a well-placed cast fires up the attack drive of an unexpected predator. A fierce little baby tarpon shows off its acrobatics, putting up a terrific fight. Okay, we're on a roll. Quick release, the way we like it. Continuing the hunt, Paul hooks up in the tough branches of the trees, a snag that can only be untied by hand. Mm. Struggling with the knot, Paul must show caution of hidden dangers amongst the mangroves. Commonly referred to as a caiman, this fellow is a true crocodile, a species few people may have heard of or believe exist. The American crocodile's numbers have drastically fallen over the years, though readily seen at Flamingo in Florida and under this bridge in Costa Rica. While not as notorious as its cousin the Nile crocodile, or as infamous as the Indo-Pacific variety, the American crocodiles grow large and is potentially a very dangerous animal. This little fellow is quite a cranky specimen, even by crocodile standards. Oh, man.
didn't land it. <laughs> Great job. Oh yeah. Each day returning to the boat launch, we are greeted by black vultures loitering about, hoping for a gift of stinky fish. Frigate birds soar overhead, doing much of the same. A narrow strip of land between the ocean and the salty swamp supports an interesting menagerie of creatures, such as these Mexican spiny-tailed iguanas. This little green chap is a juvenile. A hermit crab enjoys a little nap along the road. And my best guess here is the Yucatan woodpecker, endemic to the region. Common black hawks have an uneasy relationship with their pesky neighbours. And finally the handsome grey fox. Though this one seems to have smelt something up ahead that is none too pleasant. Anyway, we're going to do some interviews here because we have with us, hailing from the mother country, Keith, who has caught the holy grail of holy fly fishing. Grail. Let's talk to him about it now. Tell us a little bit about this permit you caught. Well, you remember you caught a permit? Did I? Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> I think okay, it was on day two or yeah, was it day one? Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was fish of a lifetime. Fish of a lifetime, yeah, it was, uh, mm. I dropped the fly, right on its nose, first cast, took it, screamed off, 250 yards later, I started gaining back, 45 minutes later, <laughs> I had a fish in the boat. Seven. 45 minutes later, yeah, that's quite the fight. Asleep, <laughs> I was reading a novel in the <laughs> Yeah? Oh, 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 oh. Hermit are immensely powerful fish, but are also notoriously fussy eaters and easily spooked, making them quite a challenge to catch. This combination makes them the most prized of all for the fly fishermen out on the saltwater flats. On many occasions we saw these elusive fish. Battling the howling winds, we sent cast after cast towards them, but our attempts to land a permit met with failure. Yet another individual has arrived in our common room who will later talk to us about the ingredients within a certain hors d'oeuvre that's going to be served and we're going to talk to him about his catch. How did this happen? We were going through this little cut in the mangroves and there was a little channel of, of deeper water in the white sand. It was an absolutely gorgeous spot and I thought, God, we could, we could uh, see something here. And then Mike says, Cuda! So I grabbed the spinning rod right out of his hands, ripped it right out of his hands, and got the plug and cast the plug. And it was a particularly good cast, maybe about four feet good away. But that thing just accelerated on that plug and just whacked it. And I had him. What do you reckon the size, length and poundage? It's 20 pounds. I don't know what the... Oh, hang on. You're always on, you know, 15 pounds from you. <laughs> well, maybe I say, should say 40 fish, then to go 20. Every one of our fish, you said it was at least two kilos less than the rod. Well, the guide said it was 20. I don't really know Barracuda because oh, I haven't, I haven't weighed any. The guide wanted to get a little more of a tip. And then we drug them up on the we drug them up on the white sand on that spot. Yeah. And the guide said, hold them up, and I said. I don't want to touch that thing. <laughs> but the thing about you hold up barracuda and you get that stink on your hands mm -hmm. and then you get it on your fly, you might as well cut the fly and throw it away because bonefish or tarpon will not hit it. Maybe that was our problem. What's that? What? The, the, you, you held that barracuda. Two yeah, touched the bonefish fly and wrecked it all. One of them and anchovy. <laughs> and that was it. Thank you very much. Anybody else want a GMT? Yeah. yeah. The other thing is with Americans, you have to. They're all on to one. Yeah, I'll take one. Yeah, yeah, I'll touch yours. This is okay. This is barracuda ceviche, which is very, very good with avocado, lots of cilantro in there. This is barracuda egg. So the female, or well, the barracuda we caught yesterday was a big female. So that's eggs fried, and then this is um, bacon-wrapped jalapeno. 
which is very, very nice. Everyone eats well around here, and us fishermen are no exception. Following margaritas and snacks is dinner. It's actually vegetarian, super good, very healthy. This is okay for me, but what are they going to eat? Towards the end of the week, the wind dies off a little in its hurricane force to but a mere category one. Gulls forage for food amongst the stinking mats of sargassum along the shoreline. Farther out, brown pelicans descend like missiles onto their prey below. What are we fishing for today, Keith? Oh, we're fishing for anything that swims. Maybe there were some fish. Maybe. During the course of the week, it was rare to spot other members of the team out on the bay. Most of the time, we were spread out far and wide with not another boat to be seen. Hi, guys. Lovely day. Listen, we just caught a fish so big, we couldn't get it in the boat. We had to strap it alongside. Considering the forceful winds and the bad weather leading up to this week of fishing, we still had many memorable moments. Having snapped my six weight wispy stick on the third day, I resorted to a three piece, 10 pound test overhead bait caster that hooked a magnificent tarpon. Like bringing a rolled up newspaper to a gunfight, yet somehow I managed to land it. So this is Jesus with the, with the big tarpon. Giant barracuda was also landed on the same rod, destroying the lure and bending out the hook. Snook were always an exciting fish to catch, and although Paul hooked a few tarpon, didn't seem to be able to close the deal. The skill of the guides cannot be overstated. Their knowledge of the area and the likely locations of the fish where and when, their know-how on which flies work for which fish, and their ability to spot them was sheer wizardry. Their control of the boat so that the caster's angle of attack to a moving target was optimum while working in gale force winds. The full extent of their contribution to a successful trip is easily overlooked, and I guarantee if left to my own devices, the bounty would not be so fruitful. With the chances of catching a permit looking grim, we focus instead on one last task at hand, for Paul to actually land a tarpon. Before the real battle begins, Luis intends to get us warmed up searching for bonefish. These guys seem to hit anything, and it's not long before a fight kicks off. All right, how's that? That's a good bonefish.
Now in deeper water, Paul's line screams as it's stripped off the reel with a hefty tarpon on the other end. Oh yeah, that's good. Even with the fish landed, it continues to beat Paul up with fin slaps to the face. Good catch. Yeah. Good catch. Good catch. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful job. It's the last supper, taking advantage of the first day of lobster season where we meet our chef, who by far is the most important member of the team and a remarkable chap. So our Mexican excursion comes to an end and we must prepare for the journey home to contemplate a great week on the Yucatan Peninsula at Esperito Santo Bay.